It says that Mary Heyman raised her hand. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, good evening and welcome to this event, um, online event at the Vena Holocaust Library. So I'm really delighted to have here tonight Dr. Anna Haikova. Um, and <clears throat> Anna will be talking to us about communist resistance in Theresienstadt. And this event is the second event um, that's been held as part of the Wiener Library's Jewish Resistance to the Holocaust exhibition that you can now see at the library. And um, tickets are in short supply, you have to pre-book, but we are going to release more tickets for October tomorrow. So you will be able to book online tomorrow at um, www.venalibrary.co.uk. So you can have a look there and find out more about the exhibition, about the catalogue and about future events. So we've got um, a couple of events um, that we've planned and a few more to come. So the next event, which you can um, sign up for already, is um, going to be Daniela Ozarski stern on partisan warfare, and that's on 17th September. In October, we'll shortly be advertising Barry Lang Langford speaking on representations of Jewish resistance um, in film. Um, so for tonight's event, um, Anna will speak to us for a time about the subject of, of, of the communist resistance group in Theresienstadt, and then I'll be asking her um, some questions. Um, you know, I found her research really fascinating in producing the exhibition. We've told some stories to do with Jewish communists, some stories about Theresienstadt, but we haven't kind of focused on this theme, so it'll be great to learn more. So, and there will be time at the end um, for people to put questions and so if you could put your questions um, through the chat and we'll we'll hopefully get to some of those at the end. So Dr Anna Haikova is Associate Professor of History at the University of Warwick and she's published widely on the history of Theresienstadt and her book um, The Last Ghetto an Everyday History of Theresienstadt will be published shortly this autumn so it'd be fantastic to see that come out. So I'm going to hand over now to Anna, I think has got a presentation to share, and will also um, tell us about this subject. Anna. Um, Barbara, it's a bit frozen. I can't barely hear you. Oh, oh my internet there we is go. unstable. There we go. Okay, good. So if you, you can start this. playing the presentation now. Okay. So thank you so much, Barbara, for inviting me. Uh, I can only endorse what um, you have mentioned. The exhibition is fabulous um, and do get those tickets. I was fortunate to see the exhibition last week and I've been working on the Holocaust the past 20 years and still I learned new things. I come to this story as a historian of Theresienstadt that you mentioned. I just, um, a, a book on which I worked for quite a long time is finally coming out. But it is also a very family oriented story for me because my paternal grandparents were members of uh, communist resistance, they were Gentiles. But in the communist group, um, there were several Jews who were communists themselves, who went into hiding, who were also romantic partners of my grandparents and who didn't survive. And many of the people who I've been researching and writing about either knew my grandparents from the war or from after the war. Um, so I'm quite aware of this emotional connection to me. And this is one of the reasons why I enjoy doing this work so much. I do hope, however, that it doesn't stop me from being a critical and analytical historian. Having said that, I already want to introduce you to one of our central protagonists, if not the central protagonist, Miroslav Karni, who you see here as a young man. I still met him as a young student, and he was one of the leading communists in Theresienstadt. After the war, he survived Theresienstadt, Auschwitz, uh, and Kaufering. 
He became um, a journalist. He wrote for the Rude Pravo, a leading communist Czechoslovak newspaper. Um, and then in the late 60s, when he was kicked out from his job because of uh, 1968 and the Soviet occupation, he was able to retire early and uh, became an early historian of the Rezinstadt. Um, he is quite an ambivalent figure, but an eminently important one. We would not be able to write the history of Terezinchat if it were not for Carney, for his curiosity and for his open-mindedness. You see him um, just in the early 50s, uh, thanks to his um, uh, descendant support. And here, and I'm very fond of this picture, you see him uh, as a survivor bearing witness, but also as a historian, because Carney was one of the founders of the Survivor Association uh, of Terezin and Lodge survivors and also one of the founders of uh, History research and Therese in Chat. And here you see him really staging himself as a historian with the files on his lap and with the, uh, you can't really read it, but these two big tombs on the shelf behind him are the Theresien memorial books, the um, uh, lists of all the people who survived Theresien Chat, but most often who perished, which too is part of the story I will touch on today. Maybe just a short disclaimer, I will not be able to tell you today the whole story of the Communist Party in Theresienstadt. I have some 20, 25 minutes, so I will touch on some aspects that I think are particularly important, but not all of them. The story I will tell you today starts in Prague of interwar time. And something that has been largely forgotten is that for interwar uh, world and Europe, Prague is one of the red capitals. This is uh, where many Polish communists, many of them Jewish, went to study because they were not allowed to study in Poland because of the numerous clauses. Some people also went here because they escaped from Hitler from first Germany and later uh, Austria. This is also where people went to study because this was like a good university to study the German uh, Charles University and then became uh, members of the Communist Youth Association. One of the reasons why we have this affinity between uh, Czech interwar history and communism is that compared to some other Central European countries, the Czech antisemitism was less developed and some Czechs were not antisemitic. This does not mean that there was no antisemitism in interwar Czechoslovakia, but seem comparably, say, with Poland or Hungary, it was a different entity, which is one of the reasons I believe why the communist in Theresienstadt primarily did not see themselves as Jews, but as I find it quite remarkable and something that will really accompany us during this talk. Most of the members of the Communist Party in Theresienstadt became communists already before the deportation in 1941 or 1942. Only a fraction of them started identifying as such in the ghetto. It was a relatively small and unattended group uh, for two reasons. Um, and that's also the reason why this is a story that um, as some of the people remark on social media before my talk, that this is such an undertold story. Before 89, this was not an opportune story to tell because these people were Jews. And after 89, to this day, this is not an opportune story to tell because they were communists. And that's what I want to maybe try to change. But some of them before they were communists, were Zionists. This book was really quite a well-known book during the 1930s, Max Zimmering, a Dresden-born uh, communist of an Eastern European Jewish family, wrote in, uh, when was it? In 1935, Zo is Palestina, this is how Palestine is like. And he tells the story of a leftist Zionist and his friends who go to Palestine and they are really dispirited by what Zionism is doing there, by the split between the Arabs and the Jews. And it ends up with him being kicked out of the country because he supported the Arab uh, Union Party, uh, the Arab uh, Labour Unions. And this was quite a book that was really influential and um, also biographical for some of the communist in Theresienstadt because some of them are uh, like, like Tetla and Friedel Placek went to Palestine as Zionists, became dispirited with uh, Zionism and became their communists. And the Placeks will be quite important for us because they eventually became one of the leading functionaries in Theresienstadt and work undercover as uh, communists. 
In fact, uh, Placek, uh, Friedel Placek wrote to some of his relatives uh, just before the war broke out. He's so dispirited by what he's seeing, how the Jews are treating Arabs, that it's actually less bad than what the Germans are doing with the Jews. These are his words. This is not what I think is a accurate description of the situation, but these are narratives and stories that definitely would not be easy to tell in uh, today's uh, Israel. And in fact, this is no surprise that uh, his papers, uh, Plachik's papers are still in family holding and you will not find them in Yad Vashem or in different archive. Some other of the communists in Terezinshat came there from the left-wing movement Hashomer Hatzair. Um, if you want to find out a little bit more about Hashomer Hatzair, go to see the fabulous exhibition of Barbara. Um, you will find them about France, in uh, occupied Poland and elsewhere. But what is specific about Hashomer Hatzair and occupied uh, protectorate Bohemia and Moravia is that they were really quite left-wing here. They studied Marx and many of their positions were de facto communist. And this is something that will be quite important for the debates vis-a-vis um, -vis the Communist Party in Theresienstadt. Now, who were the communists in Theresienstadt? Or rather, the question should be, who were they not? The Communist Party of Czechoslovakia was quite an important one. They had many links with the German and Austrian Communist Party. So when you look at what happens in 1938 and 1939, just before the German occupation, some of the key communists uh, were flown out or were allowed, were helped to escape uh, to the Soviet Union uh, just before the German occupation or during it. Some other so-called important communists stayed behind, continued in illegal communist work, were arrested by the Germans and in, if they were, I guess, lucky, were deported to concentration camps. Many of them were also executed. In fact, those of them who were deported to concentration camps, some of them were fortunate and were able to survive because as they were deported as political prisoners, they didn't undergo the selection like the Jews from who were sent to Auschwitz as Jews, they've passed through. And that gave them a little bit better chance uh, of surviving because many of the people I will be speaking about did not even pass the selection in 1943 or 1944. Yet other Jews who were communist um, lived under false identity and continued in communist work and some of them survived like that. So compared with all these groups, the people who are deported to Theresienstadt and become here members of the Communist Party, I actually own a small group, a small fraction, I think, um, and this is a speculation, less than 10%. Now what happens Clarification say, we think about today's in chat, we need to differentiate between the so called Great Fortress, the ghetto, which is where uh, the Jews of all the Jews of Protectorate and some exception groups from Germany, Austria, Netherlands, Denmark, Slovakia, and Hungary were sent between 1941 and 1945. This is the transit ghetto. However, very nearby and from the organizational point of view, independently, was the Gestapo prison called the Small Fortress. So those of the listeners today who are here, who visited, may recall that you have this very atmospheric place um, with the entrance that says, the Arbeit macht frei, labor liberates. And this was the Gestapo prison where indeed many of the people imprisoned here were communists, many of them non-Jews, but this was a Gestapo prison. And it worked as a transit to other concentration camps and prison. What I have always worked about and what I've talk about today is the nearby ghetto, which was passed by some 144,000 people. And from the beginning on, the Nazis used it as a transit ghetto, that is people came in and were sent uh, to ghettos and annihilation camps uh, in the East. Only a fraction of the people who were sent to Theresienstadt uh, lived here until liberation. But unlike Lodz and Warsaw and other ghettos, this is the one ghetto that stood until the liberation. In fact, the Rezinstadt was liberated one day after the Nazi capitulation on the 9th of May, 1945. And therefore I called my book The Last Ghetto because I thought this is a punchy title, punchy titles are good. 
Uh, Theresienstadt was run by a Jewish self-administration. The SS did not actually organizationally run the ghetto. They controlled it. They would do samples. They would punish people who were caught doing something um, that was prohibited, say smuggling cigarettes or illegal newspapers. Um, they also ran it with the help of Jewish uh, denouncers. And the self-administration did the heavy work of the, the heavy lifting of the work of taking care of access to food, uh, access to medical care, who is accommodated where. And also they had the very ungrateful job of putting together the transport lists whenever the Germans decided that there will be a new transport to the east. We have one surviving list of the members of the Communist Party, thanks to Carney, who compiled it with some of his comrades just after the war. And on this list are some 150 names. Um, probably it will be at least double. I was able to find out some additional names of up to 200. But of course, Carney did know anyone, everyone. He also may have forgotten some people. And he only talks about people who actually joined the party, which um, similarly to pre-war time and after the war, you applied, you had to have people who vouched on your behalf. But there were many people who were around the Communist Party, but did not officially become members. And I think it would be inaccurate to uh, be orthodox here and not to include them. What did the Communist Party in Theresienstadt do? They mixed themselves in two important aspects that probably to those of you who think about Theresienstadt are indeed the aspects best associated with the history of the ghetto, namely cultural life and children. Um, for sake of brevity, I decided I will zoom in on uh, children. Um, the youth care in Theresienstadt is particularly well known because uh, parents of children between um, six or seven, uh, six months or 12 months up to 18 were offered the chance that the children will be accommodated in youth homes where uh, they had supervision, whereas the mothers and fathers had to go every day to work. They had somewhat better food, they had somewhat better accommodation, they could uh, receive illegal um, education, they could shower regularly, and some of the older uh, children who were already teenagers were allowed to do um, work in the agriculture, where it was easier for them first to be on fresh air, and second to sometimes eat some of the vegetables that they harvested. Um, one of the best known homes in uh, Theresienstadt is the home L417, but what is not so well known, and by the way, if you visit Theresien, this is the place where the Museum of the Ghetto is accommodated. Um, the young man who led the home L417 was Walter Eisinger, who was one of the uh, secret communist members. And the home uh, was renamed Republic Schkit, uh, following the uh, in Polish Revolution Leningrad. And this home uh, kind of tried to run itself on a democratic uh, basis. Uh, one of the best known things about uh, this home is also the one of the voice journals that they uh, had together with them, a sum is that journal that was copied by hand. Um, and another person who is really well known in connection with children in today's in chat is Friedel Dicke Brandeis, who offered um, artistic education for children. And if you visited Prague in the Pintka synagogue, you will recall here are the beautiful uh, drawings uh, from children from Prague. I want to stress, I don't hold copyright for this picture. It belongs to the Jewish Museum uh, Prague. But the reason why we are so struck by the beauty of these images is because Friedel Dicke Brandeis was an amazing artist in her own right. She uh, was raised with Bauhaus. She had a, a thriving architecture practice in Vienna and then uh, in the thirties emigrated to Czechoslovakia from Austrofascism. She also was a secret member of the Communist Party. Um, now, how was the Communist Party in Theresienstadt organized? It shipped fairly quickly after First People's arrival, and it seems that from several transports, a couple of people found together and created their own communist group. And then it happens that two or three of these groups found out about existence of each other and merged together into one. The leadership changed over time. There were a couple of triumvirates, always with Miroslav Garni. But it seems that at least at some point, uh, one woman was member of the leadership, Ruzhena Sabojko-Lausherová, 
who later uh, was deported uh, to Auschwitz in December 1943 and led the underground communist uh, party in the family camp in Auschwitz. Um, she eventually perished in Stutthof. But what is so interesting when you read these stories is who do we know these stories from? From Miroslav Kárny. And Miroslav Kárny says that he was one of the leaders. If Ružena Laušerová had survived, is this the story we will be reading about? I don't know, but we need to ask these questions. Um, the party was run by a system of cells, uh, always with three people, and endeavored to work in conspirational work. And I have to say, I chuckled a bit when you read uh, the testimonies of usually men and who speak very seriously about this very conspirational work, but they never knew who is the other people in the other conspirational unit so that they cannot betray each other if, if interrogated by the SS. And yet later when I met Erna Frisova, about who more in a little bit, she just laughed and said, I always saw Merek Karni standing somewhere so secretly with his friends and whispering, and it was obvious who is in the other units. So the question how conspirational these cells really were is a matter of uh, opinion. However, I need to ask what would the SS really had done had they found out about the Communist Party? Would they have cared? I do not know. What the Communists definitively underestimated was how much did the Jewish denouncers uh, in the ghetto know. They were really quite well informed. They went regularly uh, to the SS headquarters and informed them. And it is possible that the SS just let the Communist Party exist because they didn't care. At the end of the day, what was really important for them is that the transit ghetto is working, that people are not escaping, um, and that nobody's smuggling in weapons. And neither of that did the Communist Party really participate in. What the communists in Theresienstadt really obsessed about is the position vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish self-administration uh, enforced by the Nazis. They did want to have um, a role, but they did not want to get too implicated because they were really influenced by the um, communist narrative already from the 30s, which you find out when you look at the communist narratives from Germany vis-a-vis -vis the Reich Association of German Jews and elsewhere, or oh, about concentration camps, because they felt that the Nazis could only govern over people thanks to the collaboration of the Zionists. And this is obviously inaccurate, but this is very much the narrative that the communist in Theresienstadt were following. And as soon as the Red Army liberated Theresienstadt, they arranged that one um, of the last Jewish functionaries, Benjamin Mommelstein, the last elder of the Jews, was arrested and spent the next 18 months uh, in prison. Uh, they had two leading members um, as part of the Jewish self-administration, but both of them were there undercover. One of them was Friedel Placek, who I introduced to you earlier, who uh, spent the 30s in Palestine. And the other important leading member was Willem Kantor in Transport Registry. Together with them uh, worked a woman, Clara Lintova, who was the secretary of one of the leading functionaries of the Jewish self-administration, that all of them were undercover. It's actually quite surprising that the uh, um, Jewish leadership never found out because um, these people, if you kind of look up the police files from the National Archive, you see that they were arrested uh, for illegal conspirational work and so on. But people like Placek, Lintova and Kantor were not only important because they could inform the communists, they were important because they played a role whenever the Jewish self-administration was forced to put together transport lists from Theresienstadt to the east after October 42 to Auschwitz. Kantor protected the communists by making a little dot on the personal file for each of them. He did not even remember their names by heart because it could have been uh, dangerous because he could have been found out and then interrogated and tortured. But that way he was able, whenever the self-administration put together the lists to plea why these people need to be exempt and he would use different uh, arguments and indeed when you look at the list of the communist uh, in Theresienstadt that we know about what strikes you that first quite some of them were able to survive until the liberation and if they were deported to Auschwitz which most of them were they were deported relatively late in uh, December 43 or in 1944 and now what I will say will be an exaggeration. 
these people chances were better to survive if they were deported late. That means, what does it mean better? It means 10% or 5%, it doesn't mean 1% anymore. And this is why we have some few people who survived to tell the story. The headquarters of the illegal Communist Party of Occupied Protectorate knew about the Communist Party in Theresienstadt. And at least twice, the Theresien Communist Party reached out to Prague and offered cooperation. Is that they meant that they would um, enable to some 30 or 40 of their members to escape Theresienstadt, go to Prague or elsewhere, and to work for the party illegally? And twice did the headquarters say no. The reasoning was that they didn't have enough illegal housing, that it was too difficult to get illegal papers, and that they needed this um, for their own people. But now comes the kind of but. The illegal communist headquarters in Prague knew very well what is happening in Auschwitz, and they definitely knew what is happening to the Jews. The communists in Theresienstadt knew that Auschwitz is something worse, but they did not know about the gas chambers and mass annihilation. For them, it was not entirely impossible to escape from Theresienstadt. Many of them worked in the agriculture. They knew about illegal ways, how to smuggle out. And in fact, some of them did escape against the orders from the Communist Party. But had they known what is happening out there, maybe they would have pushed harder. And um, we know that the Communist Party, the headquarters were able to arrange for some of the people uh, to survive in hiding. Of course, many of them were arrested, tortured, uh, sentenced to death. And yet they prioritize about who deserves to go into hiding and who not. And the people from Theresienstadt didn't make the cut. So what is it that the communists in Theresienstadt actually did? Most importantly, they trained, they discussed, they read, they asked what it means, and they wrote for each other. Um, when I was kind of preparing this talk, I was struck by how difficult it is to translate uh, the central work from Czech Szkolit into English, because you can translate it as something like to school, or to indoctrinate, or to uh, train someone ideologically. And all of these verbs are a little bit judgmentally tinged. We do not see it as something neutral. And yet, this was immensely important for the young people that they had older comrades around themselves who helped them read uh, the capital or Babels or um, Engels and to make sense of these dense texts. Now, however, when we think about this školeni, about this ideological training, it does not look like when I sit with my students from historiography and we read the capital together. Of course, it was ideologically tinged and yet, these were the building stones of being a communist of this time and era, this školeni, this ideological training was immensely important. For example, Magnik recalled how he schooled his later wife Gina in Bibles on the origins of the family. But at this point, we need to also ask the question, how should we make sense of ideology? It was something that helped to categorize and order the world immensely important in the terrifying world of the camps in the moment when your friends and relatives, your mother, your brother could be deported to the East and you never knew if you will see them again. The relationship was very confusing and full of introductions, uh, contradictions and social inequalities. And ideology and this školeni also was an important means against despair for thinking about future and what the society should look like um, after the war and after the persecution of the Jews. The communists had books by Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, and Bebel. They also smuggled in uh, the illegal communist newspaper Rude Pravo that was published before the war and after the war. In fact, it exists to this day. It's just not called Rude, the Red Pravo, just called Pravo. It's actually quite a decent Czech newspaper. And Carney recalled how excited, enthusiastic he was when it he uh, somehow managed to smuggle in an issue of the illegal Rude Pravo. And after reading it and discussing it with his friends, he had to destroy it. And he says in this very moving passage that also kind of helps us to understand how emotionally important it was for these people, that when he had to destroy it after reading, it was almost as if he's burning a piece of his own heart. In May 1943, the communists found out that the Comintern was uh, dissoluted, um, was uh, um, 
dissolved um, uh, in Moscow. And they found out uh, by smuggled in German newspapers. And they didn't know what was actually the interpretation of the Communist Party from above. So they discussed it, decided what is the probable party line and wrote a newsletter to interpret it. And two weeks later, they smuggled a new Red uh, Rude Pravo and they were so happy to find out that the interpretation was on dot. So with all this, I want to say, do not dismiss the dogmatic edge of all of this. The party was always right, even if they sent them to their death. Uh, they also wrote a few issues of some is that paper that discussed the political situation. And I want to share with you a beautiful quote by Gina Franková, back then Langsfeldová. I don't want to, I don't want to make myself into a hero. But I started working for the party. We were writing such information news. We called it news. And we started by saying Charles IV built the Charles Bridge and so on. And then there were information. Maybe Mere Carni and the others somehow got it from some newspapers. It was all conspirational. We wrote it by hand and then passed on to others. I was tasked to stay in Hashem and Hatzair. And, um, to work there with the help of the news, as we call them. I had the task of persuading the others that we would be liberated by the Red Army and that we need them. So the Czechoslovakia remains socialist, that they are not supposed to run away to Israel after the war." End of quote. And with this tasking of Gina Langsaderova, she was one of many who the Communist Party said, you guys stay in Hashem and Hatzair and to spread the word that actually the future is communist. And throughout 43 and 44, the Hashem and Hatzair leadership together with the communists had a couple of meetings about where are the mutual points, where are the differences, where they're going to agree and how the post should look like. You will not be surprised when I say the big difference was in Palestine because Hashem and Hatzair wanted after the war to go to Palestine and to make it a socialist future. The communists will say, let's stay here. We should not go to Palestine. We, most important as far as that we are communists and we should be building a socialist century Europe. Most of them did not live to make the decision. Um, I would also like to share with you the story of Miloš Pik, who was a friend of my late grandfather. He also passed away a couple of years ago, how he translated a Soviet textbook of political economy from Yiddish. Somehow this textbook found its way to the ghetto. Uh, Pick was considered by fellow communists to be a bit of an economical expert because he has read an economical textbook. He also read a bit of the capital, not that he understood, he argued. And uh, he had a friend, fellow communist, who spoke Yiddish. And Pick recalled how they spent much of 43, 44 translating this textbook um, into German, into Czech. And they translated and met and met and translated. And they never finished because in 444, both of them were sent to Auschwitz. And only Pick survived to tell the story. Among the books that the communist in Theresienstadt found was also a copy of the short course on the history of the All Union Communist Party, Bolsheviks a ghostwritten book by Stalin, but actually ghostwritten. And the chapter on dialectical and historical materialism was copied 30 times by hand and circulated and read by everyone. It did not mean that the people who read it actually did understand what is dialectical and historical materialism. But not all was only about ideological training. One of the important helps was the so-called Rote Hilfe or Red Help, Pruda Pomoc, in which uh, Communists who had better access to food were given a comrade who was either very sick or very hungry and supported him or her with food. And for some of them, it meant that they actually were able to live until the liberation. You will notice that quite often I mention the role of women or how women narrate themselves in actually quite important roles like Gina Franková, who copied uh, something 30 times by hand. And yet they stress, I was not a hero. Or Ruzina Lausherova, who is remembered very fondly by so many, and yet we do not quite know what she did in Theresienstadt. And these are kind of often the stories about women in the Communist Party and women in Theresienstadt, where because the people who ended up writing the influential reports and influential histories were men, and they kind of spoke again about the other important people who somehow happened to be also again men, and today as feminist historians, all we can do are asking critical questions. How is it? 
and asking ourselves, is this really the history we want to circulate? For me, a game changer was meeting Erna Frisova. In 2012, my grandmother passed away. Um, I uh, made sure that I uh, take care of her photographs that among the photographs was this very striking picture of a young, beautiful woman with scarlet hair, smiling infectiously. And on the other side stood Erna Frisova. I knew who was Anna Frisova, I have read her all history, and then I set out to find if she was still alive. And indeed in 2012, she was still alive. And I was fortunate and able to visit her whenever I came to Prague. You see her with me in 2012. And we spoke about the bygone time of being communists. Um, it was also thanks to Erna that she was able to cast light on Miroslav Karni and kind of bring him down a little bit because she knew him uh, quite well. Now, Barbara, how am I doing for time? Uh, well, we're a bit over, but... Okay, good, then I will move towards the end. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. With that, I want to kind of move towards the end and uh, speak about uh, resistance. As many of you will know, there is quite a lively discussion in Holocaust studies, those of us who work in Jewish history, about the choiceless choices. Namely, did the Holocaust victims have any meaningful agency? And people like myself and Eliana Adler and other have very firmly claimed, yes, they have agency. They just may look like somewhat different than you may want to say. So for uh, the Communist Party in Terezin chat, it may mean, yes, there were plans for armed resistance. We will not here have situation like in occupied Poland or the Bielski brothers, because they never managed to get hold of arms. They had very plans what they will do to do when they find arms, but they never got them. And we only know from Carney's dismissive remark that there was an uncautious and chaotic group around Edward Pietz who were planning uh, armed resistance. But then in, in September 43, Pietz was sent to Auschwitz and gassed. And all that we have from him is this dismissive remark uh, of uh, Naroslav Carney. But I think when we think about resistance, it should not only be linked into actually how much did they manage to change, but much more into where they actually able to meet and do do something. We should not measure them by success, but by the fact that they existed. Whilst a Holocaust historian, I've always had a bit of a skepticism towards sentimentalizing resistance, I think what is so important about the communists in Theresien chat and what makes them into resistance was this deliberate decision into doing something and organizing, keeping people's dignity against accepting imprisonment and letting themselves be broken. Resistance, again, is not known necessarily about success, but about doing something and not taking things passively. But, and what is really important for our understanding of it was so much about belonging, about not just being a prisoner, but having an identity that takes you out of the ghetto and makes you into a human being and being a first and foremost communist. Now, I have shared with you some of these, um, yeah, almost pathetic quotes uh, and uh, notions that they had. And can we take these people and what they said so seriously? They so earnestly discuss politics and Jewishness. And they had this very rigid worldview of right and wrong. Yes, I think it's immensely important because it really expands our understanding of the heterogeneity of Holocaust victims, ideology as face, something that orders and makes sense of the world. It is not only the Soviet history, you can have it in the concentration camps and the ghettos. What sets the communist intelligence chat apart uh, from most Holocaust victims is the conscience of historical self of being part of something larger, the omniscient party, and the notion that the USSR was kind of the good guys fighting against the bad guys, the Nazi Germany. Is this story still narratable today when the history has gotten in such a different way? I find very much after the pandemic or during the pandemic, when kind of the neoliberal state and the universities are having a hay tide of ambivalent ethics and risk aversity, I find this fighting and believing in a good thing so refreshing. Because yes, so much from what followed the Slansky trials, the anti-Semitism 1968 and the end of communism in 1989, 
has definitively changed how we will think about communist history. We are not able to unthink it. But we should still take the beliefs of these people seriously. The history tells us about how people can manage in a really horrible situation to think about themselves as a collective, not only as individuals, and to fight for a better future for all. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Anna. That was um, really fascinating. Um, and I've just got a couple of, of questions before we open it up to other people. So, so you mentioned um, post-war some of the things that happened to Miroslav Kani, but I wondered if you could tell us about a few more of, of the, the survivors and, and what the situation was for them post-war, maybe Erna Frisova or, or anyone you know, you'd like to tell us about. Yeah. Thank you. I just see with shock that it's 1942 and that I spoke far too long. And That's I, right, I, don't I, worry. But I love the story. <laughs> um, Anna Frisova had kind of a story that is quite um, similar for uh, many people that um, she felt she has to construct and build a socialism. Then in the 50s, she was kicked out because she was Jewish. Um, she didn't lose her face and had kind of these small positions. Some of the people, however, like Truda Sekaninova Chakatova, made a career in the party. And in fact, uh, Sekaninova Chakatova, who was um, a legal scholar, uh, was able to survive and function as a deputy minister uh, throughout the 50s. And then in the 60s was one of the uh, survivors of Theresienstadt and members of the Czechoslovak parliament who went to the Globke trial and bore testimony about working with uh, children uh, in Theresienstadt. You also have some communists uh, who in 45, 46 experienced uh, anti-Semitism in post war Czechoslovakia, uh, like Pedi Wallerstein, who said no more. And he moved to Israel and continued as a communist. He actually was one of the important functionaries of the Israeli uh, uh, party. And then you have people who moved away from uh, communism. And one of them was Frank Lampel, who uh, later emigrated to the UK and became a huge capitalist success. Thank you. Yeah, so it's obviously very kind of <clears throat> diverse in a way, uh, how the paths many people followed. Um, on the, the sort of question of Zionism, you mentioned how um, some of the people, uh, the Jews involved in, in this communist group um, had been um, committed Zionists. And so I was, I was wondering whether um, some of them retained um, that belief or whether, you know, as you described with the, the couple you mentioned, whether people did become disillusioned and move more definitively um, away from Zionism and, in, you know, focus uh, solely on communism or whether some people had um, perhaps still some commitment to Zionism mm -hmm. by the time they were in Trajanstadt. So the people who was able to find uh, all have, uh, who survived have all remained to Czechoslovakia and became communists. And that was something that they chose, but it was also kind of um, the social setting that was very much enforced among them. But I have also, in a different context, come across people who were assimilationist and after 45 moved to Israel, not necessarily because they were such Zionists, but because it was the only part, place where they could get a visa. And then in retrospect, their whole lives just made sense through this prisma. So you kind of often interpret your whole life into as what you ended up, but it is often quite interesting when you look, sometimes you are fortunate to have uh, people's letters. And for example, for uh, Vera and, um, what's his name? For the Schimmelings, we have their letters from 45, 46, where they communicate with their former friends from the, uh, from the Zionist movement. And they really struggle with what they should do. And you also see how they move from the old German, which actually suddenly becomes an impossible language into Czech. Right, yes. Thank you. And a question, um, and I'm gonna bring in actually one of the audience questions here as well. Um, I had a, a, a question that you did you did touch on in, in the presentation, um, but I just wondered if you could I expand on um, how in the context of Nazi oppression and being um, incarcerated in Theresienstadt, did members of the group understand their Jewishness 
And a question we've had from Henry in the audience is whether the group had um, contact in, in the um, ghetto with religious leaders, with Jewish religious leaders, and, and if so, how that sort of played out. Mm -hmm. So if I start with the religious leaders, the answer is no. They were not religious at all. Uh, this was kind of the keystone of communism. Many of them uh, were uh, before the war, um, I mean, uh, Czech or Jews, so if you want so-called assimilationists, even though that is like a difficult term, they celebrated Christmas. Some of them were baptized. Some of them also had Gentile relatives, but more than most Czech Jews in Terezinshad had Gentile relatives because it was an immensely intermarried group. I've never heard about any Jewish religious um, activity or uh, to speak of Christian. Um, the communist credo to make sense of Jewishness is that this is an ethnicity or a race and has nothing uh, to do um, in uh, the future world. You have in the late 30s, early 40s, a shift on um, the uh, doctrine of um, internationalism. But while kind of Stalin's interpretation shifts at this time, the notion of internationalism about which people like Barbara Epstein or Annika Walke have written very eloquently, this is still something that very much continues uh, for the communists in Theresienstadt. So I think the decision of the headquarters not to take in the uh, communists from Theresienstadt is not necessarily only linked uh, to uh, anti-Semitism. It is linked to hierarchies of who is seen as important and who is seen as less important. And as I tried to explain ever so briefly in the beginning, the people who are deported to Theresienstadt often were not the big players in the communist resistance movement. Thank you. Um, and um, just um, another question I had, you, you mentioned that the ways in which perhaps sometimes this history has been remember has, remembered has been somewhat shaped by kind of men perhaps recalling history and then leaving out women's roles. So I just wondered if, if you could comment on <coughs> whether within um, the resistance movement, women and men had any kind of sort of distinct or different role or, or whether it didn't really kind of work out like that. From what I have seen, yes, they have a different role because it's often women who have the job of copying and of being trained and uh, of uh, carrying and whereas men are the men who are then um, like smuggling in uh, the newspapers and interpreting the newspapers and debating the newspapers and women are seen as classical helpers but as you said Barbara this is the narrative whether this is really how it played out um, I just wanted to kind of share with you this little bit where you have the stereotypical Gina Franková saying, I was not a hero. Why doesn't she say, I was amazing. And mm -hmm. I was like the pillar of the Communist Party. I was in the Red Help. And she single-handedly helped uh, get um, one of the uh, important uh, food so that this woman till the liberation. Um, you were just um, frozen a bit frozen. there at the end. Um, so perhaps um, you might want to repeat the last bit if you're unfrozen. <laughs> oh, no, Anna must be having trouble with her connections. I hear nothing. Oh. Can you hear me now? Ah, now I hear something. Yeah, yeah, no, you've, you've come yes, back to yes. life. So yeah, we, we just sort yeah. of missed um, off the final part of what, you perhaps might want to repeat the final part of what you said. You, you were saying that, um, you know, a, a, a the point about um, people not, women not maybe almost seeing themselves as heroes and not therefore almost selling the history or mm -hmm. constructing their narrative that way. Sorry, what was the narrative? Um, so you were so you were saying that that women didn't always describe themselves as heroes when they'd have been perfectly entitled to. Yes. Um, and that that is maybe a construction that perhaps helps to minimise their role, unfortunately. Absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, it has happened to me in a different context when I worked on medicine. Therese said that I inquired about a woman who worked as a nurse and was this fabulous person, and I found her distant relative who literally told me. 
you should not be working about her. She was not important. You should talk yeah. to me. I was important. And I was just like, first I was angry. And I thought this is such a wonderful tidbit to share. Yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, well, I've, I've just got a final question and then I'm going to, I've got a few questions I've noted from the audience. So my, my final question is just, um, how you became aware of the story, what sources, I mean, I think we've, we've got some sense of some of the sources from what, mm -hmm. from your talk, but just if you could comment a bit more on the sources you've used, mm -hmm. I'll switch on an extra light. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. So the story really, I owe it to Rana Narain uh, yeah. from Tel Aviv University, um, who I met at actually at Birkbeck um, in 2016 at a conference about the Spanish Civil War. And uh, he very kindly arranged uh, for a talk of mine at Tel Aviv University. And I always kind of wanted to go here, but thought I want to do it not too quick, close to the book, because it's such a topic that goes close to home. Um, and it was thanks to Ranan and to Igal Halfin that I started working on it. And I'm quite, oh, you, it's good for you that you hear this version of the version three years ago, because three years ago I was just drowning in the material and couldn't make sense of it. And if you think this was a long talk, that talk went for 70 minutes. And I have to say self-critically, I absolutely loathe people who give too long talks. And that was the very awkward moment when I had to say, Jesus, I gave the longest talk and it was completely incoherent. Um, the most important sources, and here I absolutely agree with Miroslav Karni, are the self-testimonies, um, especially uh, the later old histories. And really important is that in 1980s, Miroslav Karni wrote some 100-page manuscript about the Communist Party in Terezinsha. He wrote it, as you say in Czech, uh, for his shelf, because in the 80s he was absolutely aware he will never be able to publish this. And then after 89, he also knew he will not be able to publish this, but it's among his uh, papers in the National Archive. And it's kind of the place which you then start and cross check with other people's oral histories. I was also able to interview um, some of the survivors uh, like uh, Irena Frisova, and that was particularly important. What was always interesting for me at these conversations is that uh, these people ask me about my political stance. Mm -hmm. And then I asked them about body political stance and you know, especially the Czechs, they kind of, you have these 90, 95 year old people who say, yeah, and do we like live today so happily? No, wasn't it better before 88, 89? <laughs> was. And it's really striking when people mm. actually wish for the 80s to come back, but it is not my role to judge, it's my role to listen. Yes. Okay, thank you. And yeah, just a few, a few more questions from um, the audience. Um, I'll try and, uh, I haven't, always written down people's names which is stupid but one question was to do with whether um this the group got um you know what did they get support from um non-jewish um communists outside the ghetto in terms of for example smuggling things in or anything like that um so apparently only in individual cases but in some news, uh, was some food, but often these were relatives who happened to be communist. I do not think, judging from uh, what Carney said, and he was, I think, at this point, I will take his word for it, they did not have systemic uh, support. Um, I do not know anything about the Communist Party, say, in neighboring uh, Bohushovice or in Rodnice, whether they cooperated. I would believe it all went directly from Prague. Right, okay, thank you. And then um, a question that um oh, let me just see who it's from a question um from harvey that touches on um some of your other research interests actually which is um did have you found any evidence about how the communist resistors viewed um gay lesbian or um you know lgbt people or is there not really evidence about that uh, there is evidence and hello Harvey, nice to see you. Um, actually, one of the very few queer Jews whose identity I was able to find out, Yeshi Verba, uh, was a, um, a self-identified homosexual man. So I was very happy about Verba because he unites my two fields of research. Uh, but otherwise, it seems that the homophobia that was so prevalent in the prisoner community was just as frequent um, for the uh, for the communists. And in fact, as Laurie Marhofer 
and others have pointed out, you have this early 30s narrative that paints the Nazis as sexually deviant, uh, linking them to the pursuit um, homosexuality of Antrim and others, and this is definitely uh, frequent among them. Right, thank you. And then um, Caroline is wondering if um, were, were there other artists involved in the communist resistance um, in addition to Friedel Dicker Brandes? Yeah, uh, very much. You have some of the important people in the theatre life, uh, like Pepe Kshtasny, and uh, some of the surviving uh, cabaret sketches. Um, actually, when you in, when you know to look for it, it strikes you with its humanism and also kind of saying we have to share the, yeah. this horrible class system in Theresienstadt. Um, we need to prepare a different future, but also you have none of the dogma that you find in the debates by discussing Babels and um, you know the short history of v VKSB. Okay, thank you. And then we've just got time for a final question, and I suppose it, it links to what you know. You would talked about some of the activities that resistors were involved in. These communist resistors were involved in, in terms of the children and also um, to do with the transport lists and so on. Um, but, but Jill is asking um, if they organised any specific actions of resistance in, in the camp. So I suppose it perhaps is an opportunity just to talk a little bit more about their activities in, in the camp or in the ghetto. Yeah. I think the most important thing that they are doing, if you want to have an action, is how they are trying to, I would say, maybe it's a strong verb, but poach the Zionists from Hashem and Hatzair. That's really a deliberate action. And um, I know about tens of people who kind of changed from Hashem and uh, to, to the Communist Party or that they stay there uh, undercover and stay with them. You have, um, especially in the youth care, uh, people whom uh, the Madricha, the youth care workers who the communists smuggle in, uh, like, um, uh, Gina Frankova and others uh, that the education that the children get um, is a check and assimilation is that also communist and not Zionist that the children are not taught Hebrew they are not taught prayers they are taught that home is in Prague in Czechoslovakia this is the Prague castle and not somewhere in Palestine but if this becomes uh, known to the Zionist leadership that is heading over the youth care and the youth care was very very strong hardcore dogmatic Zionists, people like Freddy Hirsch uh, and Gonda Redlich, this doesn't go well. And those of you who are familiar with Gonda Redlich's diary will know that eventually uh, this becomes known and it's a huge scandal and Isinga um, almost loses his job. Okay, thank you. And actually, I just remembered there was another question that um, I'm, that was to do with our um, Jewish communist sort of narratives um, present in, in Holocaust museums. And it is present in our current exhibition. Now I've noticed something actually when I've been, um, say talking to a journalist or something, I sometimes sort of leave out the context. So you end up telling someone a sort of heroic sounding story and you don't really, I don't really mention whether that person was motivated by communism or Zionism or something else. So. Um, that's just something I've noticed. But yes, it is, it, is, it is present in our current exhibition. I don't know, Anna, if you want to comment about um, whether you think that narrative is a bit sort of often overlooked um, I, in I, museums. Yeah, Barbara, I think this is really tremendous about the exhibition that you curated, that you did not skirt for the word communist. I see how often... Um, you have mentions uh, of communist resistance as something that you have like a, somebody who is a leader, but everybody else is a good guy, but is actually not a communist. If I may show an example of my own late grandmother, Alena Haikova, uh, before the, during the war at Yvishova, who was um, a Gentile, helped many friends go into hiding. And in 2016, uh, the Buchenwald Memorial, where she, she was eventually imprisoned in a satellite camp of Buchenwald, did a new permanent exhibition and they had a sign on her because she was an interested in us and she was also very good looking. So it's good to exhibit her. And I fought these bloody battles with the people doing the exhibition because they constantly showing her as a passive woman who happened to be surrounded by communists. And I explained over and over 
this was a deliberate young very ardent communist woman you don't have to agree with it no but she died a lefty and now the um Memorial German Resistance, uh, Gedenkstätte Deutsche Widerstand, is preparing an exhibition about networks of rescuers in hiding. And the same thing repeated with the person who is in charge of the Czech and Slovak part of the exhibition. But this woman is sending me text after text that treats communism as if it was an excrement. And by saying these people are communists and taking the communism seriously does not mean that we start carrying communist ID around us, but we need to value the communism. So embracing seeing the exhibition at the Deutsche, Deutsche Resistance with skepticism, it may end up that I will write an article for Jacobin. Of course, this is a thin line, and it may be that today there are people listening to me thinking I'm a brainwashed communist, and I hope not too many of you, but what I really <coughs> miss in so many exhibitions is not to be afraid of taking the political opinions of Holocaust victims seriously. Yeah, and I suppose to me it seems somewhat anachronistic to sort of, um, yeah, uh, to, to speak about their beliefs in the way you've, you've described, but anyway, it's a, probably something we could talk about much longer, but um, well, I look forward to the article in Jacobin and um, uh, yes, I think we have just about run over, but only a couple of minutes. So that's very good. But I think we've covered a lot of ground. Um, and so thank you ever so much, Anna, for sharing this research with us and talking to us about it. Um, and we'll we'll hopefully see you all again, perhaps at the library or, or at one of our online events. So um, bye, every, everyone. Um, I'm sorry, I'm in the dark now. <laughs> I have to light myself better.